show you first. So, so, so thank you everyone for the like the next lecture on in the CUDA mode series. Uh, today, uh, I, I'm I'm happy that I'm inviting like Charles, like one of my colleagues, like on the PyTorch team. Um, so, so recently, uh, PyTorch released a couple of like case studies of like Gen AI models uh, that run really, really fast and are like have basically in, in like very minimal code. Uh, so a big component of those case studies, like you might have heard of like GPT fast, Sam fast, uh, was that they were like using quantization and Charles was pretty much like the main person who authored like most of those quantization kernels. Uh, so he's here to, you know, talk to us about that. And so uh, Charles, uh, please, please take it away. Great, thanks. Yeah, so um, I uh, am going to talk about kind of quantization and the intersection between CUDA and Triton. Um, mostly going through the experience I've had over the past year doing this type of work and where I've run into problems that maybe will help you to avoid uh, doing similar snags and uh, what directions I think are kind of profitable and you know, so on and so forth. So oh, let me see. All right, are my uh, slides uh, showing up correctly? As it says, this. They, they are a little bit very. Uh, very mm -hmm. All right, so are you seeing background right now? Because I'm seeing your stream is running. We've paused the preview to save resources. Um, we, we, we only see your slides. It looks great on our end. OK, cool. Yeah, when I click when I click onto my presentation, Discord doesn't show what slide I'm on. So it's like I wasn't sure if that was everyone. OK. Um, anyway, so background about me. I'm on the PyTorch core team, as Mark mentioned. I'm specifically on the AO team. So we do quantization and pruning. Essentially, you have a model that works well, and uh, we take it and make it work worse, but faster. So um, trading off between accuracy and perf is the bread and butter that our team um, like really works in. And uh, there's now, more recently, a push for getting GPU models productionized. And so um, we're moving into that space. Previously, there's a lot more like edge on device type stuff. So quantization was something almost exclusively for CPU as far as our team was um, supporting and concerned. And uh, over the last year, we've started expanding into uh, the GPU arena. So we did work with, um, yeah, as Mark mentioned, uh, segment anything fast, GPT fast, SDXL fast, um, the quantization piece. And each of those blog posts was um, done by primarily me. and. Um, the tools that we used are available for anyone to use in a Torch AO. So um, we have a bunch of different types of quantization available that you can apply there and uh, you know use the same techniques on either repo. That works perfectly. OK. Uh, OK, I need to keep clicking Admit All. OK, and then uh, where is the? All right. Uh, I think, yeah, people in chat are happy. You can just start whenever whenever you're ready. OK, great. So for um, basically a brief recap, um, GPU quantization is what I've worked on over the past year or so. We have the tools um, that we've created available in Torch AO in this repository here. Um, we have dynamic quantization, weight-only quantization intake, and in four weight-only quantization. Each of these, the reason why we haven't had GPU quantization before this point is the kernel, right? We didn't have GPU quantized kernels before this point, and that's kind of where I first came into conflict with CUDA, with Triton, and with um, kind of kernel development. So um, yeah, all right, hopefully everything is working and to the actual presentation now. So first, let me just give a brief overview of um, quantization, since that's kind of going to be a uh, background to the actual um, talk. Um, the two types of quantization we have thus far are dynamic quantization and weight-only quantization. In the middle is you know, not quantization. Um, the dynamic quantization is pretty straightforward. You have a weight. You quantize it to an integer. You have an activation. You quantize it to an integer. You multiply those together. And then accumulate, rescale it, and you get a float out. And this tends to be desirable because multiplying two integers together 
is much faster than multiplying two floats together. So if you have two BF16s, you multiply them together and compare that to multiplying two int8 tensors, it's about four times faster. So if you have something that's very compute bound, like the segment anything model was, dynamic quantization tends to work pretty well. There are other forms of quantization like static that work even better. They're even more effective at compute bound systems, but dynamic is, is pretty simple to implement. So this is the first one we did. Weight only quantization on the other hand, instead of having the activation kind of move to a lower fidelity, the activation stays as is, and you either multiply immediately with the integer with the mixed D types, or you dequantize the quantized weight and then do the multiplication. So, so, uh, so, so Charles, I interrupt you, like uh, kind of a pet peeve of mine, I was curious to hear your take on this. Like, I almost feel like saying something like int4 quantization is actually a very ambiguous term. Like ideally you should say like something like W4, like weight four, and then, you know, like basically uh, uh, like, like gradient 16 and then, or BF16 and then accumulation 32. Like how come this sort of terminology never really picked up in the community? Because um, usually you say like in for dynamic quantization, which kind of implies everything is being dynamically quantized to in four or in for weight only quantization, you're not quantizing the activation at all. And so there's like a myriad ways you could then go, like you could dequantize the in for and the multiply. You could do a mixed, uh, like what you really want to do, you don't want to do the dequantize. You just want to multiply an in for times the, times the, what is it? Like the fractional part of the float, right? Like you have an, you have an int eight in your BF16, you have eight integer bits. And then you have four integer bits in your int four. You would like to multiply them and this overflow into the float part of your um, BF16. So like really the key of like what you're doing, like where the perf comes from is that int four and then whatever the activation is doing is usually like less important. But if you're doing like, I agree there's weird thing, weirder things now where you have like group wise quantization and symmetric and affine and being a bit vague can be problematic. I, I, I definitely see that. All right, thank you. Yeah. So um, in any case, we um, we have both uh, A16W4 and A16W8 uh, weight only quantization, and then uh, A8W8. So everything's 8-bit and for dynamic quantization. So um, the big key in both cases is the multiplication step. How you do that is where you're going to um, win or lose in the perf battle because um, either you're getting a compute improvement in dynamic quantization, or if you notice weight only quantization, you're actually doing more stuff. Like there's a strictly like comparative loss if you look at not quantized versus weight only quantized. And so you'd think that actually makes it go slower because you have this rescale here that you don't have. You have the same multiplication, you have this dequant. But what you, uh, the advantage of weight only quantization is that you're able to load the weights incredibly fast. So in situations like llama, where you're not compute bound, you just need to get all the weights into your uh, GPU memory as fast as possible. Weight only quantization can be very effective and it's more accurate because you're not messing with the activations. So if all you care about is how fast you can move things, don't worry about activations because they're already in there. You just got to get the weight in there as fast as possible, even if you're doing additional um, math. So you that that's basically dynamic. So the question that was asked is, why not quantize the activations if you're doing weight-only quantization? And the, like, the long and short of it is, the thing that's kind of blocking you, you're memory bound. And so you want to kind of be just jamming weight after weight after weight after weight in there as fast as possible. You don't want to be putzing around with doing a bunch of math with the activation, materializing intake versions of the activations, filling up the memory with more like intermediary steps. You'd rather get the activation, get a new weight in there, do whatever the fastest thing you can to get the math done, then move the next weight in. So it's essentially like, um, you know, both simpler and has less overhead than um, the compute bound case. So. Um, you could, you can do it, and in some, but like, you'll you tend to find that the overhead tends to dominate if you apply dynamic quantization in a weight only uh, in a, in a memory bound situation. So, 
dynamic quant goes slower in llama than weight only quantization does. Chat, the general question regarding quantization is like every um, is model equally well quantizable, or is it some? Is there even techniques during training that you could already make sure that it's better quantizable, if that's yeah. a word, <laughs> in the end, or is it? Um, and also like because like we are talking about eight bits, four bits. Also, is there like one bit uh, or like one, only the sign? I don't know. Of uh, there's also a quantization. Yeah. So like quant there's like a whole world of quantization. I actually did my PhD on quantization and sparsity. You, like there's a whole way to like, oh, look at pruning as a method of quantization. Look at quantization as a method of pruning. And um, so there's there's um, like something called quantization or training where you train your model and it's aware that um, quantization is going to be applied to it. And so yeah, QAT fine tuning, as Thomas said, you essentially back propagate the gradients across the quantization operator. So you kind of fake quantize things to do all your math in FP32 and cheat because rounding is not a back propagatable step. But if you just ignore that, then it actually works really effectively. And um, there's all these different techniques. So in order to get in for uh, quantization working for GPT fasting at the accuracy we wanted, we had to implement GPTQ and we wanted to do it ourselves because we wanted it to be model agnostic and the, the kernels we had didn't align with like the auto GPTQ thing that um, uh, most people use. So there's, there's a ton of techniques in, in different models. Like at, as someone on the quantization team, what happens every once in a while is someone at Meta is like, hey, we have this model, we need it quantized. The accuracy is garbage. We don't know what's wrong. Can you please help us? And we have a pretty small team, so it's not something we like love to do when people are like, hey, your tools are not user-friendly enough for us to do it on our own. But um, yeah, every once in a while, you'll hit a model that they need help. And it's it's more than just doing some simple QAT. You have to identify the layers that are sensitive to quantization, what ones aren't. Um, in a lot of cases, if you're doing like categorization, easily quantizable. If you're doing regression type uh, machine learning, much harder to quantize. Yeah, yeah, managing the the weights and the uh, distribution of the uh, activations. Did Did you have a question, or David Dickinson? I see your hand is up. David, can you unmute unmute yourself or? No, I'm sorry, that was a mistake. Uh, go okay. Ahead. okay. Yeah, so um, if we want, we can talk more about pure quantization. Um, I have a good amount of experience there. But uh, yeah, so uh, assuming people have a, have a good overview of quantization, uh, we can, I'll happily field more questions. We can move on to the individual kernel. So first, dynamic quantization. So let's say you're trying to, you know, you're me a year ago. Uh, your boss tells you, hey, we need some dynamic quantization on GPU. We have Torch Compile, which can take anything you write in Python and turn it into a very efficient, um, magical Triton kernel. So uh, get on that. And so naturally, you you know, you know have your linear x.w. You know, if you're quantizing things, you factor out your scales, and then you multiply your integer matrices together first, and then Afterwards, you're going to rescale it with your x scale and your s scale. So mathematically, it's very simple if you're doing symmetric um, quantization. There is a small wrinkle. Sx could be either like a single scalar, like in the per tensor quant, or um, in w, you could do per tensor quant for um, the weight, or it can be over the whole um, outer dimension of x and w. So if you have, you know, your x has a, you know, a, M, K, and N, and, and M and K dimensions, and W has K and N dimensions. Um, as long as you're not trying to scale your tensors over the K dimensions, you're good because what you get out of X dot W doesn't have a K dimension in it. So if SX and SW do, you're going to be in trouble. If they don't, though, then you'll be in good shape. So we have been doing uh, per token and per channel quantization. That's one of the awesome things about doing GPU quantization. On CPU, you're like, oh, can we afford a vector operation um, where we rescale everything, maybe we should just have a single scalar that we multiply everything by. On GPU, it's equally as fast to just do it with a whole vector as long as you're only doing it one time. So um, that's great. 
So now we need a kernel to do this uh, int map mall. So you can go to your Triton uh, tutorial, grab their uh, kernel. It works perfectly well for uh, int dates. Plug it in, and what you'll get if you applied it to the segment anything model is a significant speed up, about six to seven percent speed up. But what you might be surprised to see is the peak memory actually gets worse. So um, this I actually ran this yesterday, um, prepping for this uh, talk. Uh, redid these numbers, you get actually a pretty significant, what is that, like 15, 20% drop or, or increase in the memory. So that might be a bit surprising, but if you look at the actual D types involved, you'll see why. When we multiply two int eights in order to avoid overflows, we have to accumulate to n 32. And by materializing this n 32, we're, we're twice the, the fidelity of, of a simple uh, BF16 when you multiply x times w. So that's where all the the additional memory has come from. We're materializing something that we don't need to. So what do we do? If, if you're a Triton engineer, you can simply alter the way that you materialize your tensor. You add a little multiplication at the end. You, you bring SW into the equation so that instead of storing um, your x times w, you multiply x times w and then scale it by this scalar at the very end. And um, voila, if you manage to do that, you get another, almost double the speed up what you had before, going from 785 to 731 and then down to 695, brings you to about 14% uh, perf improvement over the, the baseline. And uh, peak memory actually improves, not a ton because you know everything's still BF16. You get a little bit advantage when you're, you're, if your peak occurs during the, uh, the map mull itself, but otherwise pretty comparable. And so we're better across the board. Now, how do you actually do this? Because this is the part that was actually a big struggle. This should be simple. Just adding a simple multiplication to Triton is not hard, but getting Torch Compile to do it took weeks because Torch Compile did not want to fuse the multiplication operation. And so I had to hard code an option to, to when, when it detects a pattern of integer map mul and then a multiply afterwards, you can enable config.force fuse int mm with mul equals true. And then a little multiplication operation gets tacked onto the uh, the int mm. So um, this I think is like the thing that Triton is incredible at. You have so many times I'm like, oh, I have this awesome cutlass kernel, but it's slightly off from what I want it to be able to do, and it's like a pain in the butt. I have to like add new kernels here. It's just like a single line in Triton or hard coding something in Torch compile. It's not as easy, but this is the thing I think Triton does super well, adding a couple different operations, combining simple things together and getting something efficient out of it without having to like break the bank and spend weeks re-optimizing is so convenient. And we knew what we needed to do. It took a little bit to get it to work with the monolith that is Torch Compile. It's magical when it works. It's magical when it doesn't work. It's equally frustrating like when it doesn't. So as awesome as it is when it does. But um. Yeah, so so this is an option. Probably need to make this a default so that uh, people stop running into that. But um, that'll be another day. So and you can actually see what is going on in in Torch Compile. If anyone is interested, whenever you put a map mult in, there's this template here, and it's basically uh, a little bit different from the tutorial you'll find on their website. And uh, it basically uh, picks block M, group M, all those different constants, like any config Triton auto-tune does, and then it shoots out a bunch of options. So you append a bunch of different choices. You can have fallback. So in the, the default int, where is the default one? Yeah, so the default int mm, it has like the the Kublas, uh, 8 and Kublas kernel as a fallback option, and uh, all works really nicely here. And uh, you know, someday in the future, far, far away, we'll be able to have you know all these awesome kernels, and it'll auto tune between all of them and find the perfect configurations. And I won't have to do NCU profiling of my kernels anymore. But until that day comes, um, you know, we'll have to manually update the configs and things in here. But anyways, this was my first brush with Triton. It was awesome to get it working. It was super frustrating to then uh, run into a brick wall a bunch of times until like hard-coded an option in frustration. Um, this should be something that Triton, that, that Torch Compile does automatically. Fusing things is like one of the two main things Torch Compile does. And it does it 
really well in certain cases. And then there's these weird specific things where, oh, there's a point-wise op here, and then there's a max operation, and it does all those epilogues first, so there's no way it can put a little multiplication there on its own, which is really annoying. But um, yeah, I guess, you know, it, it, people are working on it. So um, that was the first one. This is the simplest one. Next, let's talk about weight-only quantization. So this one, it seems simpler. You're not messing with the activation at all. Um, also, by the way, for the dynamic quantization, the nice thing is all the actual quantization stuff, you just write it in Python, and uh, PyTorch and Torch Compile handles it all. So um, don't need to mess with Triton even at all to, to get that working, which is awesome. So uh, yeah, any questions about the dynamic quantization stuff? I'm going to talk about weight-only quantization where the actual kernel optimization stuff will start. Uh, yeah, Charles, I, I had a question. I was wondering if you could dumb down the the aspect like regarding the intermediate materialization. Like, it's it's not like you're not like um, like I I think what you mean is like you don't need to restore the materialized tensor back to uh, like the high bandwidth memory. Like like you, like you don't need to store it back in DRAM, but yeah. presumably it's still being materialized in in SRAM, just like in a blockwise way. So could could you talk a bit a bit more like? Just because, just like for me, one part that still seems also magical is like, what does it really mean to change the D type of a tensor, and like on on the on the on the CUDA side, is it like, yeah, like just just like any, any more details you have like around how these convergence processes like work on the lower levels would be very helpful. Yeah, so I guess the way I look at it, I'm not the most fluent in CUDA, but if you look at the the Triton output after you like torch compile something, you'll see that it has to kind of pre-allocate space in memory for all these tensors. So in this case, we have like, this is a one by 4096 activation. This is a 4096 by 1024 weight. And then you have a, a, a scale and a bias here. Um, this is actually from the weight only um, optimization. And so in addition to that, it, it right here, it materializes an empty um, uh, 1024 by no, that's not right. Well, I think those are the strides. But anyways, it it like materializes the result of whatever this operation is going to be because it needs a place to put it in. And so it like if that's an in 32, that's taking up a ton of space that it doesn't need to. And while all your threads are going and they they hold an in 32 and then kind of garbage collect them, like that's fine. But when it actually has to be stored on the memory, um, that's when you you see these peak memory increases in the slowdown. And, and yeah, I think you're right. It's not like the the high activation right after you multiply two things together, you're always going to get that N32 when you multiply two in dates. But if you then just multiply it by a BF16, you can store the BF16 here for whatever the next operation is. And so that's the like the difference where you're actually allocating that space in the the like, I don't know, lower um, access speed memory in order to use it for the for the later operations. Does that answer it? I don't know. This might be exposing myself as not the most sophisticated CUDA person, but um, that's how it looks in the experiments that I've run. Yeah, I, I think it does help. Yes, thank you. Richard, I had one like, more general question to quantization. Maybe could like one two sentences about how does it, this work in, in general? I mean, I've, uh, there's like different scales of loads with different exponents in, in these weight matrices. And um, at, at which granularity is this quantization happening? So is it like, if I take, if I would take like the full um, weights and like I had to stuff them into four bits, it could like imagine that's like not, not going to work. So it, it has to be at some finer granularity and, uh, yeah, maybe yeah. some some background about quantization because I don't know everybody is like, <laughs> as you are obviously is very deep into this topic. Um, yeah, I have. Uh, I don't think I have the. Just as a conceptual uh, maybe overview of what, what's yeah. happening and doing. So the simplest thing that you can do, like for example, in dynamic quantization, all you're doing is um, saying, okay, the biggest value I'm seeing in every channel is like negative one the, the and then or smallest is negative one biggest is negative one so i'm going to assume all the values are between negative one and one and i'm going to map that to the integers from like that intake 
uh, represents. So you have kind of an even, a bunch of even values, uh, evenly spaced, uh, uniformly spaced um, in that range. That's essentially what you're getting in quantization. So you can think of if your values go from negative one to one, and that's a range of two. If you have you know two to the eight values that you can use to represent those, then you know you get uh, what is that 128. Um, one over, or two over 128, like that's your spacing. So um, if you have values, that, if you have like one at negative one, one at one, and then everything else is between like 0 0.001 and 0 0.002, you're gonna have a terrible time because it won't be able to resolve the differences within there. Um, it, and so this is essentially the same strategy that's used both in the weights and the activations in this case for intake. When you do dynamic quantization, you have a little bit accurate. So actually you can see, I think I have, is this where, no, that one is llama. So you can see, okay. So here is Sam. You can see the accuracy degradation on COCO 2017 validation. Uh, FP16, you like no changes when we just apply different techniques. When you do weight only quantization, a little bit of a drop. Um, actually, when you do dynamic quantization, it's within the margin of error, it, it, it gets a little better, which is, it's just error. Um, it's not until we apply this pruning that we, we really see a drop. So COCO was a pretty easy task. Um, intake quantization, usually not too much of a problem, especially if you are, um, you know, not quantizing like convolutions and stuff, because we're only quantizing linears at this point, because those are the ones we have kernels for again. Um, if you are quantizing, you know, convolutions and layer norms and every single thing under the sun, then you start having problems and you, and you want to do QAT or you might want to identify what layers are sensitive to quantization and stuff like that. But overall, it's like the most simple thing you could imagine. Just evenly divide up the space and then see if that works. If it doesn't, you know, maybe try weight only quantization. And if that doesn't work, then GPTQ, QAT, stuff like that. Okay, but is it done like for the full weight? Like, uh, or is it like done for a row or column or like a tile so, inside the weight? Yeah, so um, you can do it in different ways. We do per token and per channel on the weight. So it's it's per the output channel on the weight. So every single output channel gets a different scale value. So if you know one output channel goes from negative 100 to 100 and another output channel goes from negative one to, to one, those both have good fidelity, no issues there. All right. Okay. That that was what you already mentioned before. Okay. Th yeah, thanks. No, okay. There's yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so I don't know if this intuition helps. Like, but but feel free to spot check me, Charles. Um, so 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 basically, I think one of the reasons why like you have these sort of perch purse, like why you segregate like different quantization schemes, like either per channel or per tensor or per vector or per block, is because typically to when you're rescaling things. Uh, the way you rescale is like with the with the value of the maximum value, and so if you end up having anomalies in your data, you're gonna end up having like different quantization buckets that are very sparse and some that are very filled up, and if you sort of localize how you quantize, you end up having more quantization scales, so you, there's more VRAM that you need, but the result is that you're less sensitive to like anomalies. And as a result, your sort of out, your accuracy is better. So this is kind of like how I, I think of it. Uh, Charles, is that sort of roughly correct, by the way? Yeah, I mean, so it depends on the model. Like in some cases, it's outliers. That's like the determining factor on how your quantization goes. In other cases, it can be a non non stationary distribution. If you are doing like categorical, um, you know, categorization, right? And and one category has a vastly different different distribution than another category certain types of quantization won't work super well. Like if, if one channel has a bigger range than another, if you only do per tensor quantization, like one channel is negative a thousand to a thousand, another channel is negative one to one. Well, all of the values of that negative one to one channel, it's gonna be effectively zero, right? So um, separating them allows each of them to behave differently. If you have some outliers, then the other channels aren't affected. Um, there, there are methods that, that work better for outliers than just hoping that you're, you're additional scalars solves it but um yeah that that it, it does help every every additional scale you add helps all right so um yeah good good questions and uh so weight only quantization so we did something pretty simple last time and 
it would seem that that would work, right? We could basically just take that same matrix multiplication kernel and add a change in D type, because that's all we need. We need to take this, this value right here is an int eight. We want to multiply int eight times a BF16. So if we just convert it int eight to BF16, that's usually fine. BF16 has, by the way, if you do quantum, if you do like stuff with FP16, uh, I, you're, especially if you're if you're doing quantization at the same time, you run into tons of overflow problems because FP16 has a really poor dynamic range. BF16 has a great dynamic range, so you can convert like, uh, you know, int eight directly to BF16. In 32, even directly to BF16, you usually won't have issues. So um, if we just take this int 8, convert it to BF16, multiply it times our BF16 activation, that'll probably be fine, right? And that'll be fast. And so like, you know, the dynamic quant kernel was fast. So let's see how that goes. So um, I tested that out. You can see it's right here. It's directly in PyTorch. We added this prologue cast uh, in terms of terminology. Epilogue means it's something that's happening to the output. Um, so we like added an epilogue here to add a multiplication to rescale the output so it's not uh, in 32 before. In this case, we want to change the uh, weight to, no, no, sorry, the uh, activation to be uh, BF16 or, yeah, yeah to, to, to make it be BF16. And then um, that would ideally work. So if you were to do that, you would get everything working. It accumulates to FP32, rescale it times a scale factor, SW here, because you're not you're not quantizing X anymore. You're only quantizing W, so you only have one scale factor. So all that works nicely. And no, it works terribly. It's horrible. It's so bad. It's slower than just doing a normal non-quantized mat mall. So this is Llama 7D. And I also ran a micro benchmark here. It's on the order of like 15 times worse, something like that. Um, I, by the way, I have repros for all these experiments at the end if anyone is um, interested. So, uh, yeah. Well, so why why is it so slow? So there's a couple things. First of all, we're doing a lot more work with this kernel. So first of all, we have to load our um, integers, and then we have to do operations to them. And then after that, we have to do additional rescales, and then, which doesn't seem like a ton, but it it adds up. I think there's and then there's I think there's another reason why that I'll talk about later. But in addition, it seems like and this is a bit hindsight. The block size may be limiting us because if you look at these um, these kernels here, the the if you're doing like a tensor core type thing in Triton, these like group M things are limited generally to being greater than or equal to 16 or it throws errors. And um, if you try to profile the kernel, you'll see that like, if you could make this be eight, you'd end up having uh, 128 blocks. And with your 108 multiprocessor A100, you could saturate it, but you can't because half of them aren't able to do anything. So that's another reason you're not using half of your GPU. So what do we do? This is actually weirdly, oh, that's actually here, a problem that uh, Torch Compile can solve for us. It's like the reverse of before. Here, it's Torch Compile to the rescue. So I didn't figure this out. Uh, Horace Hay, the guy who did uh, uh, GPT Fast, uh, he was like the main person, and then I did some of the quantization stuff. He realized for int 8 weight only, if you use this weird way of doing a map mall, where you um, essentially, like if this is uh, 1 by 100, you add a one at the end, so it's one, 100, one, and then this would be, let's say, 100 by 100. You basically do an element-wise multiplication and then sum along the dimension. So you're kind of manually doing a map mall. If you torch compile this, you get a blazing fast kernel. And uh, let's look at why. So the big difference between this kernel, sorry, if you guys haven't looked at a lot of Triton code, I'm kind of glossing over it because well, it's, it's kind of Python and also looking at code is not the coolest thing for a presentation. Um, if anyone has questions, please ask them. But essentially, the big difference here is we're not using tensor cores here. There's no actual um, chunk. Like normally the way that these kernels work, If sorry, I know this is making it really hard to follow. But if you look at this, what ends up happening is each uh, group ID here, like every single thread gets a chunk of the output 
to store to, right? So it has this IDXM, IDXN, that's your output like indices that you're gonna store. And so it does all the processing of like all the rows and all the columns of X and, and W in order to get that chunk, a, a square of values in for the um, output. And if you instead do this weird manual mat mall, you don't get that, oh, sorry, that's not online. You get instead every single column of W gets its own thread. So if you have 4096, like I was doing in this experiment, you create 4096 different um, like threads that need to be processed. And then um, the X block here is always one. And then every single time our block is processing like a full column. So basically the, pro the program ID is just which column of W you're processing. And then it, it processes one element of the output. Every single thread does one element. It's like fully parallelized like that. I guess the overhead of all these threads is, is fine to like make it go fast enough. And um, it actually accumulates an FP32, which I didn't realize this until I was trying to code for this uh, talk. Um, probably this could be optimized a little more, but um, yeah, this works incredibly fast. So before we were up here with the red, now we're at the yellow. And this is like yellow might seem worse than the blue by like a factor of two or more. But in reality, we have, uh, when you do torch compile, there's some overhead there. So the blue is just like a Kublas kernel and yellow is this kernel plus the torch compile overhead. And if you do apples to apples comparison and just put them both into llama, you'll see that you're like four times faster now compared to the, compared to the weight only kernel and almost like what, twice as fast as the, uh, non-quantized one. So, 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 Charles, sorry, just like a dumb question. In this case, you're doing like a vector to matrix multiplication, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and and this is sort of like embarrassingly parallel because you can sort of parallelize a block ID over the columns of the matrix that you're multiplying into. Yep, exactly. Okay, got it. Thank you. And, since, and so since you're focused in um, batch size one for Llama for uh, like personal use cases and, and, and general memory bound situations, yeah, you have a one by M and then like an M by M or some or M by K, whatever it is. Um, you're always processing all of the X and then one column of W, and that's how it parallelized it. And it and it kind of got around the restriction of the um, like minimum batch size of sixteen because I'm I'm not actually sure how this is like with the rules, but it, the way it loads things is a little bit different if you if you look. And this ends up just being significantly faster. You would think making four four thousand ninety six different threads would be slower. It's faster. All right. So yeah, we end up uh, blazing fast. This what this is actually. We have a slow uh, GPU here. It's like power limited. So the actual numbers, if you go into GPT fast, they are like um, like one hundred fifty approximately for the weight only quantization with this kernel, and um, that uh, you know almost 1.5x what you get without quantization. So 50% improvement for a little bit of Triton code that Torch compile hands to you on a silver platter is pretty nice in my opinion. So um, yeah, it, it also it's like one of those weird situations where you, if you look at what happens, the decomposition, it's looking for a map mall and then it swaps it into this if the shape is zero, uh, if like the, the shape is one, on one of them and you have this option for coordinate descent tuning where it's like hey this is fast when this option is enabled i don't know why let's look into it at some point um it never did but uh yeah so again it's really awesome when it magically works it's also some <laughs> it's frustrating how magical it is but uh yeah it's it's really cool to see so um this this is the kernel that we've been using for Weight only quantization. We we had another person put a cutlass kernel into PyTorch recently. I tested it out. It was basically the same, which is um, you know pretty frequently we see that the Triton kernels are almost as fast as uh, uh, you know cutlass or CUDA um, kernels that that people have written. Um, if you really do a good CUDA kernel, I'm sure it'll be faster, especially if you're like optimizing over the specific uh, sizes. But um, the fact you get something so nice so easily, this is where Triton really shines, where, and, and Torch Compile really shines, where it's taking something, um, you know, in Python and making it incredibly performant um, with, with little effort. 
So um, we're, we're still, yeah, we're not matching the, the micro benchmark, but we are killing it for Llama. And um, one of the only problems with this is it only works for batch size one. We still don't have a great kernel for batch size greater than one. So if any of you guys, you know, really want a cool project, figuring out how to do mix mat moles for batch size greater than one would be, is, is really important. So, yeah. All right, are there any questions? I see a lot of chat. Yeah, like uh, I think while people are asking questions, like uh, if, if anyone is sort of like interested in like a, a working group to sort of like figure out the batch size end problem, like Andres has already been like setting up like a ring attention group. I think it's been one of the more exciting developments in the group. Uh, so this is like really interesting. So if, if you are sort of interested in spending some of your time there, I, I can like work with Charles to sort of like guide you on the right path. Uh, yeah, if there's any other questions to like let, let us know in the chat. Otherwise, I think you can keep going, Charles. All right, yeah. The, the one question I'm, I'm seeing is why is batch size greater than one tough? And I think uh, my answer is because it comes back to that key question of like, you're no longer able to do this because you do now need to index over um, the, the activation matrix as well. Previously, we're just able to say, hey, the columns and the, the full activation matrix are approximately matchable one to one. And so that is sufficient. Now we have to also kind of go across the activation matrix, which makes it more compute bound rather than memory bound. And that's when it starts getting hairy and it's unclear if like that's just solvable. We had a bunch of cases where SDXL um, fast, they have a ton of situations where it's not one by N by like a one by N multiplied by N by N, but a two by N multiplied by N by N. And so we can't use this and it's super annoying. So um, it, it's really fascinating because I, I was thinking, Okay, we, we are like in this situation where it's completely memory bound, and there should be, like, especially is this is this, is this opportunity to have like batches, um, which then give us op yeah basically the possibility to leverage the full um, compute yeah power that we have, uh, and not like waiting all the time on the memory to arrive <laughs> and to be written. Yeah. yeah, and I think I think the other thing is. It comes back to this 16 being problematic, where you're able to have, one is probably not optimal. Maybe two is optimal, but two doesn't seem to be an option. If you were like, I bet there's a way to rewrite this so you are processing two uh, columns at the same time instead of just one, and that would probably be faster. But um, it seems like it's kind of picking between 16 or one, and it ends up being one is significantly faster um, in, in, the, in the situations that I've seen. So. So I think it would be really great if we could like separate this problem out uh, so that we could deal with it in the group and like profile it a little bit and check also the situation one. Um, for the Here, mark, but... So just a spoiler alert. Yeah, there's at the very end, I have a gist here with all the scripts. And if oh. like this kernel is in the gist, um, you can see it's... Uh, well, it's it, you generate it here. Um, I know it's here. I okay. So yeah, right here. So you you torch compile this. This is one of the things uh, I make a benchmark. So if, yeah, I mean, there's a reproducible. You can compare it to a bunch of different ones. Um, yeah, uh, if if people want something different, we can we can figure that out. But yeah, um, uh, I'll make these slides available. Okay. So uh, if there's any link to the code as a starting point. Yeah, I'll, I'll share the slides or I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get that done after the, the talk probably. Um, Cause it, I think this is technically like my Google account is attached to meta so I can't just share things. Um, okay, so uh, in four weight only quantization. So this is where things start getting tricky. And I think where Triton starts falling away and CUDA starts becoming more and more important because you start having to pay bigger and bigger prices for using Triton. First and foremost, it, there's no N4D type in PyTorch, and there isn't one in Triton lang either. So you end up having to do weird things like packing manually and then unpacking manually, which is slower. And so you're paying a bigger cost to do that unpacking. And on top of that, um, you know, th th these things aren't effectively supported. We're losing more ground because we have more expensive packing and unpacking operations. And then and that's especially compared to what we want to do, right? Like what we would love to just do is you have 
like a sign bit here, a sign bit here, and then you have an int eight, right? It's seven fractional bits plus a, a sign bit, and then one sign bit and uh, three bits. This would be so easy to, to, to like, like you could program the logic here to just do a normal int multiplication bitwise here. And then, oh, if this number is like far enough forward that it's going to make this number overflow, just bit shift it right once. You know, it'd be very, very simple to implement. But there's, yeah, there's no uh, good way to do that because, again, this is where, you, so you can do fancy stuff in Trite and, and CUDA. And I'm, I'm going to show you a kernel that does fancy stuff. And you guys can go look into it because I don't fully understand all of it. Actually, I don't understand much of it. But it's incredibly fast. There is QInt for four by two, so that is a bit old. Uh, the QInt D types are from our team because we have like native support for quantized D types. And for GPU though, we're using subclasses, so they're not really going to be used. You can get those on. Actually, I was the one who made it possible to put those D types on GPU. But um, yeah. The int or uh, classes will be handled through subclasses, and um, we do have uh, a uint four by two kernel that I'll that I'll show you what I made. It's a kind of an abomination, and then we have a good one as well. So that's what you would want to do, right? You would want to do a very simple multiplication. You don't have to mess with this exponent at all, but in the process of actually like using Triton, because you don't have access to that low level manipulation, you have to do these large scale conversions where you're converting an int four into a BF16 to do a multiplication, which is insane, right? We do not want to do that. So, well, let's see wh what we can get just using Triton anyway. So the first thing you have to decide, how are you going to pack it? As someone mentioned in chat, there's a four by two D type in PyTorch. So that's naturally where I went and you have four options, right? If you have, these are essentially how you're going to pack two numbers of int four size into an int eight, how do you unpack it? Which is a non-trivial question, right? You can either unpack it like right next to each side. So this A, you have to insert another row in between these in order to, to see where you put the B. Or you could just put them directly next to it, right? So you can have the B, D, G, H just to pop in next to it or below. Or you can have it pop in between the, the rows up and down. So in my case, since we're doing um, multiplication, uh, of the weight, primarily we'll be processing columns. So we want things that are contiguous in this representation to be contiguous in this representation. So the bottom right one, right one makes the most sense. Um, and uh, we choose that also because you don't, it, most of the uh, kernels you'll see in Triton, they process the entirety of the K dimension, the inner like matrix multiplication dimension. And so you don't want to be loading A, B, E, F only to get A and E, or only to get B and F. So if you were, you were if you were processing this one in the top right, you might do A, E as one thread, but you had to load twice as much data as you needed. Whereas if you're processing A, B, E, and, e and G, it's the same amount of load. So the bottom right is the one that I want with. All right, so sorry for just like one logistical thing, like Google just informed me that our call will end in 15 minutes. Uh, so, uh, uh, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Charlie, but like I guess if we could finish up like the core content of the talk, then and then you know we could always move back to Discord for Q and A. Uh, you know we'll try to have a better setup for for next week. Uh, and apologies, yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Okay, so fast forward. I implemented this abomination in uh, uh, PyTorch. It, it, it's in the PyTorch code base, and it's incredibly slow. It's as slow as the other one. Then um, the guy who wrote the entire PyTorch GPU backend landed a, or not, he didn't land it, but he developed it, an in four kernel, and it's in PyTorch. If you are interested in it, it's right here. You can use it, convert weight to in four pack, and then use this weight. The, the usage of it is also in that gist uh, I'm going to send out, but um, it's insanely fast. It's uh, so fast. It's, it's faster here. You get up to like 200 tokens per second when you're not on my uh, crap, my slow uh, rate limited GPU, which is almost 2x. It's more than 2x the speed here. And then um, this is kind of the the, the big presentation we had with uh, the GPT fast because this is like soda per four and four as far as I can tell. Um, so having this is this is I think the boundary. This is what you can't really do in Triton. Maybe someone can do it who's much better at this than me. 
Um, there's probably some optimization to do. If I was going to do this again, I would write the uint 4 by 2 kernel in the way that that fast int 8 kernel was written. Um, there's no easy way to get PyTorch to give you that kernel, as far as I can tell, since you have to do like the packing and unpacking and stuff yourself. Um, you can't just do the sum, unsqueeze, multiply, and then sum, and then torch compile that to get it. But if uh, I think you could write it so that it's faster than 93, but but definitely not 135 tokens, or sorry, uh, 187 tokens per second. Um, that'd be insane. So this this is where I think like the the key um, limitation of Triton starts to show when you're doing complicated operations in non standard D types, you run into issues, and um, you know, we have problems with M4, problems with batch size one, uh, greater than one. There's some issues with L2 cache operation for all the weight um, only stuff as well, because uh, you have situations where you're, you're processing and unpacking a bunch of data. And when the batch size is greater than one, you want to unpack that data and then another thread wants to use it. But what's in the L2 cache is what was loaded, which is the like not it's the still packed version. So you end up having to do, every thread has to do the unpack operation every single time, which ends up slowing down a lot. Um, and additionally, there's some weird things with config consistency. If you pick the fastest config and then config and put it in a bunch of other configs, it picks other ones. The heuristics aren't the best, and this is really annoying. The strengths, on the other hand, um, all of int 8 you can do in Triton, which is insane. Um, Torch compile gives you most of it too, which is even more insane. And um, there's even crazier things. Like uh, the, the coolest thing I've seen with Triton is that um, flash attention is the fastest growing kernel in um, PyTorch, right? We were trying to get SAM to run faster. And there's a stupid bias where it takes two small tensors, combines them in a way that make, takes two four-dimensional tensors and makes them into a five-dimensional tensor. And then it wants you to materialize that. And then that's how you would put into flash attention. So when we do that, it's slow. But um, my teammate Christian wrote a Triton implementation of flash attention that just does that add because it's easy to add these things. Like when you're when you're doing a block in a block, it's hard when you have to materialize the whole thing. And so this this is super fast and, and was a significant speed up of our um, of our results for for Sigma anything. So yeah, if you want to get seventy five percent of the way to optimality without ever looking at a .cu file. Triton is great for that, as long as you're doing something reasonable. Um, if you're messing around with int4 and, and, and doing crazy stuff, then it is probably not in the cards. But otherwise, I think it's definitely, um, that's what Triton is. Like, if if you're not Jeff Johnson, if you're Charlie Hernandez, um, you know, that's that's what I've kind of fallen in love with Triton. And, and I'm going to be doing static quantization and, pro and probably have to implement all of uh, uh, Christian's flash attention in Triton statically quantized on top of it because that's something that's possible now um, just because Triton is so accessible. Okay, and then lastly, uh, Torch.io where all my stuff is and then uh, the micro benchmarks and, and other releases where you can go and see a lot of the things and reproduce the experiments that I've been talking about and stuff. Um, yeah, I'll move into the to the uh, Discord to uh, um, answer questions if, if, if there are more. I, I certainly have a lot more, so so thank you so much, Absolutely. Charlie. Yeah, so let you so let, let's move back to this. Word. Yeah, thanks everyone. Yeah, and the um. Voice channel, maybe it's uh, it's simpler to do it here. Yeah, let's wait a couple of seconds for everyone to arrive. <laughs> Yeah, trust. Thank you so much. It was very um, like deep uh, presentation going into this quite so simple topic. Yeah, I think I 
I don't know if if I can if I may start uh, with a question for you. Um, have you also tested like Tim Detmer's uh, bits and bytes uh, um, library for quantization? So why did you uh, go into this direction to writing your own stuff? Is it like that you found it's too slow? It's not um, giving you the necessary functions? Yeah, so the reason why we started this thrust is because of the fracturization of the technologies in the OSS community. There are so many people doing incredible things that are building off one another. And if you work in 95 that isn't like ostensibly like directly interfacing with them, it's hard to keep track. And so we wanted to show that like, hey, you can get that level of performance and memory and whatever you need using native PyTorch in an easy to use way and trying to make it more accessible for people, especially people that are trying to get into it and don't have the ability to follow, you know, three year old Twitter threads about optimizing X formers and on top of, you know, QLore and stuff like that. So try, so that's the, the biggest reason, like there's a thousand repos out there and trying to take the the best pieces and and make it accessible to to individuals in a way that like you know pytorch has always done there's you know there's a reason why layer norm and batch norm and all those operations are available in pytorch it's not because they were invented by pytorch it's because people wanted to use them wanted to make them accessible in in a in a useful way so that's why we started this and we also thought that we had unique advantages right having um, access to the PyTorch, the Torch compile team allowed us to to move faster and add hard coded options that maybe aren't necessarily easy for other people. And you know, having my questions answered when I'm like, hey, how do I get this working? And then on top of that, um, like someone like Jeff Johnson working on Int four, dropping those kernels and making those available, um, like the fastest thing that I think is out there. I'm not sure if there's anything that's faster in Int four right now. I know that like there's an Auto GPT kernel that um, has had a bunch of optimizations by people in this group itself, which is super cool, especially again, that's just Triton. And um, like, I know that that one's a bit more accurate because I've looked at that kernel. It has some like tweaks that it has some additional like uh, customizability that makes it a little bit more accurate. But in terms of like pure speed, um, I think Jeff Johnson's is the fastest, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me. So um, those are kind of the reasons why we we set out here there's it's so hard to keep track of everything otherwise yeah okay thank you very much yeah. anybody else who wants to ask something yeah we we have compared but you asked if we've compared like with bits and bytes and um bits and bytes is doing like they have a lot more focus on like qat type stuff and their kernels are not um the fastest as far as I've seen. Like, for example, their dynamic quantization kernel does a kind of hybrid int FP16. When it identifies layers that are tough to quantize, it does them in FP16. We're kind of just like, yeah, you can solve that with either QAT or uh, GPTQ. Um, we're trying to be as fast as we can. So, um, you know, I, I, like, I think there's room for everyone and, and it's up to the community to decide what their use cases are and what they need and, and what they want. So, um, yeah, and I think in the yeah. bytes and bytes, I saw that it's, like it's using um, like table-based lookup for uh, like for example four-bit quantization. Is would something like this also be possible with, with Triton to implement? I don't think so. I'm pretty sure not. I think in like so you need an FP4 D type or something along those lines. Maybe someone smarter could. Could, there, there's probably a way with someone really smart or maybe just a couple tweaks to the Triton language to enable that. I know that like FP4 is something that the kernel, that Jeff Johnson kernel, he has an internal version that he's working on that ha that's called, um, actually, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this, but there's another one that has like support for um, FP4 at the very least. And so it's something that's like on the way. I know it's like, it seems like if you're doing four bit, FP4 tends to be a bit more accurate. So it's something that we're aware of. I think that's that's part of the trade off where you're at the like the, the totally different end than than uh, uh, bits and bytes that bits and bytes kind of had 
like accuracy first and you have now speed first a lot more right yeah and actually so the there's another there's another one out there quanto and they're doing some really cool things um as well i think bits and so it looks like to me the direction hugging face is trying to move is more towards the the quanto one like i know that like one of their employees is developing it so i'm not sure where like them versus bits and bytes versus us um all fits together they're all like really cool technologies and there are only so many engineering hours but um yeah i mean check check them all out they're all like one of them's gonna win and it, everyone will be using it in, in two years anyway so it doesn't matter who So I think also NVIDIA has some um, custom FV8 kernels, at least. H have you looked uh, at them as them? Are they had like quite, quite nice numbers in there. Um, also, they, they have like especially great numbers for high throughput scenarios, so also um, larger batch sizes especially. Yeah, so one of the weird things is it looks like, I, I think if I remember correctly, NVIDIA removed, I think, Int4? kernels from the H100 or something like that and they and they instead moved to FP4 on the H100. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and and I know they have a D type that's it's like a combination like MX something. Um we haven't directly uh compared with them right now what we're focusing on is so what I'm what I'm working on now is um, a lot of the different layers in the models need different types of quantization, and it's a huge nightmare to figure out which is which. And so we're trying to make an automated tool to do that um, for you. So um, perf has been uh, not the biggest concern for the last month or so, but um, yeah, I, I've I've heard like we have a list of all these different quantization technologies, like QUIP is one, AMP is another, where these are kind of more. Um, rounding oriented rather than kernel oriented and then we have all these different kernel options that um it's it's always like a question of prioritization of which one we're gonna try to support next what's um maybe the appetite for like the amd side of things for hardware support for your triton i I'm not on the Triton team. I would love to know, though, because I think that is something that could really um, open up AMD. I know that I, I had an AMD GPU on my gaming PC when I was in high school, and I haven't had one since I've started machine learning since um, CUDA. But yeah, I, I I I can comment on that briefly. So, like, uh, if you look at, for example, the GPT fast like blog post, like it did share numbers on AMD, which involved like no code changes, uh, because like the idea is that like any GPU like vendor would plug in at the Trident layer. So there's certainly like an appetite from the community. Like I think it's a question that comes up very often. Um, so that's from the Torch compile side, but also like from the eager side, if you go to the PyTorch repo and you like look at the like label for AMD, you'll see there's like a lot of like even eager kernels that are being like hippified. Uh, so basically they take in CUDA code and then they generate like hip code from it. So yeah, in general, appetite is very high. Uh, it's one of those things, you know, where like more bug reports are really helpful. I think it will help like AMD build a better product. Uh, and, you know, if it's like, it's the more interesting the model and the use case, I think the more likely they'll look at it. Yes, and as a much more weirder extended question, uh, I saw that a year ago, uh, Triton team said that they have plans to integrate with uh, uh, newer Mac ver versions. Have something been done about that or not? Um, uh, yeah, mean, like M two and so on. Yeah, like it, it's generally quite hard for us to, to make comments about hardware vendors. Like typically these things are kept secret until they're done. Uh, so like I, I can't comment too much on that. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Just more, more practical question. When you use um, Triton, so uh, do, do, you, do you install it directly from, from GitHub or um, do you use the version which comes with uh, the latest PyTorch? 
um, built or <laughs> because I have yeah. like sometimes had the situation that the, like the version that was in PyTorch was a little bit too old and it was so fast moving and Triton feels for me a little bit fakey sometimes so that it's not it's still developing I would say yeah yeah it's actually really annoying <laughs> I have like there's a bunch of times where I had some really really nice results on um, my machine and I realized I had like a, a like a, a mid-level, like not the newest and not the version of Triton that's on PyTorch. And then um, when I upgraded or downgraded, that awesome result went away and uh, I got real sad. Like we had a 15% speed up on SDXL fast on my machine. And then when I changed Triton, it dropped down to five. So that's what we ended up like releasing. It's it's really tough. I primarily use the PyTorch one now just so, for re reproducibility. And we have a bunch of like um, other like people that are, uh, you know, trying to do their own experiments. But uh, yeah, getting on the most recent version of Triton and then seeing if it's like really fast is always nice when you get a good speed up. Maybe maybe also um, more a political question about um, Triton. So is this is this like a, an open AI product actually, or is it is it like also some foundation like agreement between different parties so that for example if if Meta or if like PyTorch uh, Foundation is now relying on this very heavily that it's not taken away in some sense that it's like don't know, new license comes up and then uh, for for whatever reason OpenAI says that our oh, next generation Triton is no longer uh, available for um, ordinary people. <laughs> Uh, yeah, or is it yeah, like some some yeah. make sure in some way um, as an agreement upon? Yeah, yeah let me let, awesome. let me let me let me jump in there. Like I think um, basically, if you look at like the latest like Trident conference, like they they had like a couple of talks, and like the vast majority of those talks like came from like hardware vendors. Uh, so it's like basically it is a strong dependency that a lot of like hardware vendors are taking on. There's like a really strong relationship between like the Torch compile team. And the Triton team, uh, they, they're like a lot of the core Triton developers are even are even co-authors in the PyTorch two like paper that was like recently published. Uh, so this is like like this is like kind of a, a non-issue as far as I can tell. Okay, great. That's good. Good to, to know. So is there uh, like uh, really uh, crossover uh, also happening between uh, uh, PyTorch developers and and Triton developers? So is it like becoming a real foundational element of, of PyTorch next next generation? Um, yeah, like in, 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 in general, like Triton is like a core dependency now. Uh, so yeah, like the, the Torch compile team is certainly taking like a strong like bet on using Triton to generate its CUDA kernels. But but there's also like kind of like other other backends, like Intel has a CPP backend. So depending on which layer you plug in, you'll get optionality in the backends. But at least like for GPU based perf, like Triton has still ended up being like one of the best bets that, that we made. Um, I, so, so by the way, I, I did want to circle back to something, Charles, like maybe more of a technical question. Um, so uh, well, one thing I found interesting is that like, like as you're doing, for example, like a matrix multiplication, like let's say with like two int eights, like what, how do people decide, oh yes, like let me accumulate this result in BF16 or FP32, like, you know, why not FP64? Like, how are these decisions typically made? Is it more like heuristics or is there sort of like strong reasons that FP32 ends up being like a very popular accumulation type? I think it's largely about, I think it's largely defined by the hardware already. Um, in a lot of cases you have, like I know the kernels for int8 multiplication naturally accumulate to n32. And if someone had a current, like, we ran into cases where like Jesse was doing, he does sparsity and they had a sparse kernel with that combined with quantization did um, int8, int8 that accumulates in int8 and just had so many overflow issues. Um, like, I mean, for me, when I was, you know, in any time I have an auction, it's always a question of what's the smallest value that doesn't run into overflow issues. And, um, most of the time that's either bf16 that's bf16 but um yeah it, like if i could accumulate int8 int8 into bf16 directly i would do that that would probably be faster 
and probably also like part of the reason for not using like larger like 64 bit uh, data types is that, that like the CUDA or the device support is very poor for such things right so that i don't know what like h100 has how many um, double precision operations are possible but it's normally it's like optimized for um 16 bit and maybe a little bit also 32 bit yeah, I mean, oh. I've never had a situation where I wanted to accumulate in 64-bit, and I could, and I like 30 FP32. You can accumulate anything into there, even into eight, into FP32 works fine. And then, um, I I, I struggle to imagine a scenario where accumulating in 64-bit is like the right choice. It has to be some massive tensor that, like, um, you know, when you add everything up, it's just overflowing or something, but. I haven't run into any situations like that. Just since you are a, an expert for quantization also, and um, uh, do you have also looked at these extreme cases of one bit um, quantization, for example? This is uh, this is some, something where still something useful comes out of, of such networks, or it's then completely breaking down? Um, no, there's actually some really cool work. If you look up the QUIP paper, um, that's another type of, it's essentially, it's doing something similar to GPTQ, where you have to do a bunch of pre-processing on your weights and everything and know what your activations and the Hessian of the activations is going to be ahead of time. But then once you have that, you do some pre-processing on the weights and the activation to get them to, I can't remember the term, but um, they essentially, they're like, uh, eigenvalues are orthogonal. And then when you multiply them together, you don't get the type of quantization error that like propagates like you do normally when you have um, the activation quantized and your weight quantized. So it kind of uh, prevents this like um, these knock-on effects. And so you need a kernel that can do the kind of um, orthogonalization and then deorthogonalization of the like ortho you have to orthogonalize, then multiply, and then deorthogonalize the result. And the QIP people have some kernels that do that. And I haven't like tested them myself to see how fast they are. But if those were um, comparatively fast, they're going down into like int two and getting reasonable results. And I know people like are looking at int one as well. So it's that people are getting reasonable things. It depends on what you want. If you're trying to get an LLM working, that might be harder. If you're trying to get, um, I don't know, MNIST solved, that's probably pretty easy. But uh, yeah, it, it, people are doing it. it. It's it's an actual thing. Another another thing that's really common is power of two quantization, because mm -hmm. at that point to do multiplication you just have to do bit shifts, so that's very efficient, and you can write really efficient kernels for that type of quantization. Um, there's a bunch of different weird things if you really go into the weeds with quantization, and uh, yeah, it's it's always a question of like hardware support in combination with accuracy and combination with um, you know, people being interested in it. Yes, that's interesting. Do do you have some some tools, for example, to view the the distribution um, for the weights or some? But uh, is it like a case that you analyze the the weight actually a little bit more of a network if you get something before you quantize it, or is it completely automatic? It's not necessary to uh, to really look in. So how many outliers there are, or like how's the distribution as a more than a mean and max, min and max. Yeah, it it depends. So like the the it depends on what technique you're using. If you're doing uh, the these basic types of quantization that I talked about here, if you're doing int eight, um, usually you're fine. If you do um, the int four quantization, you have to do GPTQ, and it, what that is it trying to do is it quantizes. So you take a weight, right, and you know you you. You run your model a bunch so you know the Hessian of the um, of that layer. Essentially, you, you just uh, accumulate activation, transpose, activation, and then average that over a bunch of inputs. And then once you have that, you try to um, quantize column by column the weight matrix. And then when you quantize one column, you alter all the other values of the weight matrix to maintain like the Hessian multiplication afterwards so in that case it's like a much more sophisticated technique where like you have to do a you have to have a bunch of data to quantize it then you have to like spend a bunch of time running all your data through calculating hessian do a row 
calculate the updates, do another row. And it's, it's, it takes like an hour or two to run. But, um, you know, other techniques, it's, you know, if you do intake weight only, that'll be done in, in less than a second if you run that. You don't have to do any type of analysis. You don't need any data. Um, that's the allure. So I, I did want to plug two papers that really helped me understand like some of these nuances, like basically the, the Q-Laura paper by Detmers and then LLM into eight. So in the Q-Laura appendix, like they have a study where they basically like do a statistical test on the weights of pre-trained LLMs. And they notice that a lot of them basically essentially have their weights like they're, they're, they're sort of like zero mean and normally distributed. Uh, so like that this, like, it was sort of like folklore knowledge, but like they, they, they sort of did a statistical test for it. And sort of similarly in the in the QLORA paper, like when they propose like alternate D types like NF4, it's really to make sure that the distribution of weights like follows like a normal distribution. So yes, like this is very much something that's useful to plot. Like you get a histogram of your weights and you look at it. And ideally you want to make sure that like the weights aren't like like that that you don't have any sparse buckets and that like they're mostly all of them filled up otherwise like as you're going through like a, a lower like a lower bit precision you're not using its full range so like a lot of quantization algorithms that talk about like you know you're scaling and like moving the mean a lot of these ideas are so that you can make sure that the full range of the lower d type is actually used otherwise you're just you know wasting bits And Charles, would you say that um, this quantization is also the best option for, for tools like speculative decoding, these techniques, to instead of using a separate um, network? So is the, in general, the distribution very similar to, yeah, so that probably it should be because it's like the same model, like just quantized. Um, so yeah. your, your uh, experience, you did this probably, right? In this, um, yeah, I think I... I um... I think Forrest did those, and you can see the results in the GPT Fast repo. Um, if you just mm -hmm. type GPT Fast, he has speculative decoding experiments. I yeah, and he quantized the uh, 70B Llama two and four, um, and I think he did GPT Q on it to um, on Wikitext, and then ran it and found. I, it, it's always a trade off between like speed and accuracy percent. And so I remember he presented to our group that uh, trade-off where he was picking the, the specific size he was going to use and then quantizing it. But I, I don't see it here. But yeah, um, I think quantization is, you know, um, it, it's possible. Like, qu quantization is one tool. Uh, sparsity is getting there. We're getting more kernels, more support, and things. There's probably some combination. There's a, an ideal world where you go layer by layer and identify what kind of what data is wasted and get rid of that perfectly in a, in a, in, an, in like a magical mathematically perfect world. And so quantization is a part, sparsity is a part. You know things like knowledge distillation and and things like that are, are definitely going to be a piece of that. Um, it's certainly not only quantization. If I was going to do speculative decoding, um, I'd probably do quantization because it's it's the easiest one as, and I have the most experience. But um, in in another year or two, it could absolutely be a combination or or you know sparsity only or something like that. Yeah, it always feels that as if we currently are still like scaling up things that we we see okay it's it's working, but all these quantization uh, I think they indicate to me a little bit that probably we don't need all the weights, <laughs> at, a, not in, at least not in non-zero um, fashion. Yeah. Let's yeah, see what this uh, It's maybe like hardware, um, like this hard, like hardware lottery thing that we have like very efficient things to, to do matrix multiplication, dense matrix multiplications. And for, um, for this fast thing to really kick off, it's, it's probably like not the, re the right tools are there right now. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's, it's sparsity it's also it's available possible. in Torch.io um, for GPU, but uh, yeah, it's there's there's a lot there, and it's one of those things where I think there's no like there's never going to be a simple thing. Um, I spend a lot of time taking a model and going layer by layer and trying to figure out what technique each layer is going to be sped up by and stuff like that. It's like a really laborious 
laborious process. And that's the type of thing, because you'll be like, oh, this layer changes, you know, the speed up by 30 milliseconds, but the accuracy goes down by like a half percent. And like, there's some Pareto optimal front that you're moving along, and it's very non-trivial figuring out where the optimal point is. And you can always put more effort in there. Um, yeah. But by the way, accuracy. So is this like the main metric which is observed in the monitor? Because it's... It's, I don't know if like if it, is it the best is would be like a, a perplexity or something be better or like more realistic perplexity is weird um okay. we did a bunch of analysis. you can look so when i send the slides out you'll see um there's some analysis about the accuracy of llama with um different different uh, group sizes and bit widths and stuff like that. And it's really hard to say, oh, the perplexity dropped by like 0.1. What does that mean? You know, like, oh, this one dropped by 0.1 and then it dropped by a further 0.15. Is that like twice as bad if it's going twice as fast? But it's like, you know, it's it's really hard to say what perplexity actually means to a real person. And it's tough unless you're doing like human evaluations to get a really clear understanding of it in my experience it is very robust like you can very much it, it's very like granular you, you you know increase the group size a little bit the perplexity drops a little bit and and some of the like if you do a uh, hella swag which is like another evaluation task um that one is much less granular you know you change mm -hmm. something she doesn't change at all so like it's it's very useful perplexity is super useful but there's still like you know, I wouldn't say it's like the perfect measure or anything. That that is what we used, but um, it, you know, it was tempered by trying out the gambit and then figuring out what was most useful to us in that situation. Yeah, like like e evals is a sort of like whole deep field because like you know, it's like then you could even get into debates like, well, was hella swag enough? Should you like like which data sets are enough and like what's representative? So uh, the way I think about a lot of these metrics on these eval data sets, like they're sort of like useful as a CI check in some sense, like as in. If there's like a serious degradation, that's really bad. Uh, but often I think what like, you know, Charles was alluding to with like, like vibe checks, uh, you know, like or human preference tends to be sort of the, the most like indicative thing in the short term, because like it's just pretty obvious, like if, if you're like language starts speaking a different model, starts speaking a different language after being quantized, you know, that's like really bad. You know, that's kind of the kind of stuff I've seen before. All right, we're we're at ninety minutes, uh, Charlie. Thank you so much, folks. If you have any more questions, thank you. Uh, you can find Charles here on this Discord. He goes by HD Charles. If you're interested in following his work more closely, uh, you can go to the PyTorch Labs AO repo, which will have like all of these techniques and pure Python, and you can go like play around with them. You know, try it out. You know, give feedback. If anything's broken, we'll fix it. Uh, and uh, I guess like the, the topic for next week, uh, I'm going to be talking about like CUDA performance gotchas. Uh, so we'll get back to, you know, profiling related stuff. It'll be a follow up of the first lecture. But please, please, you know, if you could just like emoji dump on Charles, I'll be very grateful. And uh, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Charlie. This, 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 this was great. Yeah, great, great, uh, great talking to everyone. Thanks for your awesome questions. And uh, hope you guys have a good weekend. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I, I try to get in contact to, with you to collect a little bit of material for our uh, lectures uh, GitHub so that we can uh, gather there everything. And yeah, it was absolutely a pleasure to have you here on Q Mode. Thank you so much. <laughs>